Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning as we gather together to celebrate the gifts of God that are poured out for us. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we can confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the peoples of earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom, and make us desire always and only your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. At this point, I invite the children to come up. There's, I think I saw Jack around. Do you want to come on up? <coughs> So, um, do you know what a servant is? What's a servant? Yeah, somebody that works for another person, somebody who serves, somebody that helps another person. Uh, so you can be a servant in all kinds of ways. You can be a servant by uh, helping out with uh, housework, by helping out with schoolwork, by helping out with all different kinds of things. I want you to think back to this week and think of a time when you were a servant. Can you think of a time when you were a servant this week? Okay, when? You forget? That's okay. That's okay. Grace, what's the time when you were a servant this week? I'm just helping around at the house. Yeah, helping around at the house. You know what? That is great. And you just helped, and you were just a servant to your brother here too. So that's also great. Thank you. So can you think of a time? And you helped your mom. Yeah, that's great. This is a sticker. It says great. And today in the gospel lesson, uh, I'm going to be preaching on Job, but you're going to hear in the gospel lesson that Jesus is going to say, whoever wants to be the greatest must be servant of all. And that's because, ultimately, Jesus, whenever you're a servant, whenever you help people, whenever you work to make things better for others, you're reflecting who Jesus is. And you're showing them who Jesus is. And because Jesus is the greatest of all, when you reflect him, you do great work. And so, I have these here. I have some stickers that I would, you know, I'm going to give to you. And I would like for you to give them out this week whenever you see someone serving. Somebody serving somebody else, you tell them, that's great, because that's uh, what Jesus wants us to do, because that's what Jesus did. And the good news is that, and the good news is that um, Jesus came to give everything that he had, to be a servant so that we could live, and so that we could have abundant life, and so that we can help to serve others. And so let's pray. 
Gracious God, thank you for today. Thank you for life and for breath and for coming here to serve us and to care for us. Help us to care for others and to celebrate it when it happens. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming up. The Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What is it you want us to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now when the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them in and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them. Their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. You may be seated. <laughs> Why do bad things happen to good people? It seems a crime against nature and the God who made it good and very good. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's enough to make you wonder if God is good, or even if God is there. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's a question we all ask in one form or another at one point or another in our lives. It's a question I've heard in hospitals and homes, in classrooms and offices. It's a question that's been on my own lips many times, as I've floundered or failed, or simply scraped along the jagged edges of my own broken hopes, dreams, and expectations of this life. Perhaps you have too. Why do bad things happen to good people? The question is a thick jungle with many entry points, few good exits, and many dead ends. But we are not left without guides to help us through. The book of Job sits near the middle of the Bible and aims at the heart of this question. Written as part of our wisdom tradition, think of it as a giant parable that finds its truth not by historical facts, but by speaking to the truth that we have all experienced through story. The book falls into four major parts. Part one, setting the stage. Job is the picture of a pious and righteous man. He cares for the widow and the orphan, gives justice in the city gates, and even makes sacrifices to God just on the off chance that his children might have sinned while he wasn't watching. Job is careful to do everything right, and he feels blessed because of it. He has abundant riches in children and herds and land, and his expectation is that this abundance will remain as long as he continues to cross every T and dot every I. Now, if you take a look at the picture, you can see um, there are instruments there, but the, uh, this, all these illustrations that you'll see are from William Blake, who's a poet. Uh, and these are his illustrations of the book of Job. And so we have um, the instruments up there, but really people are too, too busy to use it. Um, uh, 
and I'm, I'm doing a review of myself too, so if I can ask you to move over slightly so I can see how I'm doing. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, you'll notice it's a very peaceful scene, even the sheep are asleep. But scene one then moves up to heaven, where we see God in his throne room talking with the heavenly court about how righteous Job is. However, not all in the heavenly court are convinced. Satan, as God's prosecuting attorney, suggests that Job's care for God is purely self-interested, and that Job wouldn't be so righteous if God stopped giving him rewards for being such a good boy. God takes Satan up on his wager and gives him permission to destroy everything that Job has. So Satan takes away his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his camels, and finally, his children. But hey, Job, at least you still have your health, right? Then Satan takes that away, too. Leaving Job sitting in a heap of ashes, covered in boils and sores and scraping himself with a hunk of old pot, while his wife tells him to just curse God and die. Job proclaims that he wishes he was never born, and curses the day of his birth, and yet in all of this, Job doesn't accuse God or sin with his lips. Scene 2. Job's friends arrive to comfort him. At first, they simply sit with him for three long days, not saying a word. As it turns out, this is the best pastoral care that they will do for the entire book. Then they open their mouths. And out of the mouths of Job's friends come some of the most popular theories of his day and ours on why bad things happen to good people. All of their words are variations on a common theme of rewards and retributions. Those who do right by God are blessed by God and cared for strictly and in every instance. Those who do wrong or sin against God are swiftly punished. Think of it as instant karma. What goes around comes around, right? And so, since God is good, and he obviously works through rewards and retributions, then the problem in this system must be Job. Figure out where you've sinned, what you have done wrong, make atonement, ask for forgiveness, and then all of this pain and brokenness will go away. Have you ever heard this argument? Have you ever made this argument to yourself before? If only I would shape up a bit more. If only I could figure out what I have done wrong, then I could fix it. If only I could get it together and fly right, then, then, God would love me and care for me as he used to. Now, as good Christians, we can say with Paul that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But remember, this is a parable, and so less concerned with precision on all points than with the point that it's trying to illustrate. And the point is, Job's sin is not what's causing all of this. And so Job says, I'm innocent. And his friends say, think harder. But Job is confident that he hasn't done anything wrong. He's also confident that, of course, God works through a tight system of rewards and retributions. And so his eyes start to turn toward God. Where is God? If only I could make my case before him, he would understand what a horrible mistake has been made and he would fix this awful mess. Surely God would vindicate me and clear up this mess, because God works through rewards and punishments, and I have done nothing wrong. Or as Job puts it, I would learn what he would answer me, and understand what he would say to me. Job argues with his friends, until God himself shows up in a whirlwind, and thus begins scene three of which today's reading is but a small part. God's speech from the whirlwind is not what we might expect. In the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey wishes that he'd never been born, and he's given Clarence, 
the portly angel, to comfort him and to show him all the good that he really has done in his life. But when the maker of the universe shows up for Job, comfort is not the primary item on his agenda. Who is this that darkens counsel without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you. You shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. God continues on for two more chapters. We want God to tell Job all about the wager with Satan. We want God to apologize for all of Job's suffering. And yet, God seems to come out with a big old, I'm God, I made the world, I do what I want. And in a sense, I suppose that's true. But there's more to the story than that. In God's speeches, he takes Job on a whirlwind tour of all of his creation, talking with great pleasure about the nature that he has made in its beauty and wildness. And how he loves the creatures that Job would never have even thought of things that never would have even crossed his mind. Even Job, he's talking about animals that even Job would consider dangerous to him and to his world order. God lays out a universe he has made in which the foundations are sure. Chaos is loud and welcomed, and yet also given limits. As it turns out, this world is not all about Job and his righteousness, or lack thereof. And God will not be a simple vending machine where our good works go in and blessing comes out. God shows Job a world that was made for the sake of God's love of creation, rather than simply constructed for Job's use. In an arid climate, in a land, where water is a precious commodity. God makes it rain even out in the wilderness where it's of no use to humans at all. This world was not made for humans, but humans were made to be a part of this world, a world of freedom and grace, more than a world of reward and retribution. A world where God is not standing vigilant watch as a cosmic hall monitor, scanning for any possible infraction of the rules, but rather one who loves his creation in all of its forms, including the ones that make no sense to Job. God loves all that God has made, even the chaotic elements that are a threat to us. God sets limits so that chaos won't overwhelm everything, but he gives it its place, and that means that sometimes bad things will happen to good people for no particular reason at all. This is the wisdom that the book of Job has to say, an offering of a wiser perch from which to view our present circumstances. And there is true wisdom in that. The book of Job ends with scene four, in which Job is given everything back plus more. His new perspective means that he doesn't live as cautiously or pretentiously as before, but embraces all that God has given as a gift, rather than something that he can and has earned, or something that he can control and maintain through manipulating God. It's an if we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended moment, where you are allowed to forget that this whole book ever happened or glean from it what you can. And that is where the story of Job ends. But that's not where God's story ends. While I believe that there is great truth and wisdom in the book of Job, it is not the fullness of God's answer to the suffering of his people. For in the fullness of time, God sent his Son to walk among us, to be the truly good one to whom bad things happen. 
to step into that chaos that is natural and that chaos that our sin has created and to bear it so that we never need to bear it alone. To come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To show us that his love is stronger than our ability or inability to get it right and to open up a way to eternal life. So that when the natural chaos of this created world and the sinful chaos that we have created for ourselves do finally overwhelm us, even then, his love will hold us fast and bring us safely home. This is good news. And so we say, thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Heavenly Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
May God's grace be upon this shelf, warming, comforting, and enfolding. May this mantle be a safe haven, a sacred space of sanctuary and well-being, sustaining and embracing in good times as well as difficult ones. May the one who receives this shawl be cradled in love, kept in joy, graced with peace, and wrapped in love. Blessed be. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. <coughs>